Hello everybody, this is Tommy Darker and today I have the big honor to have uh, an interview with uh, Danny Ini from uh, Canada, Modro. Hello Danny. Hi, it's uh, great to be here. It's my honor to be talking to your audience right now, so thank you very much for having me. It's my pleasure, it's my first interview, so thanks a lot for accepting this. Uh, Danny is uh, the author of the blog Farpole Marketing. Uh, uh, giving great advice to people starting out uh, blogging right now and how to build uh, and, and a highly engaged audience and how to drive sales through this audience. So um, he really has an expertise. He uh, built his audience uh, throughout one year and right now he's in a good position to give us some nice hints about how us musicians can uh, implement marketing in our music way. Uh, so, um, let's get started. First of all, uh, to tell the truth, um, how I came up with uh, having an interview with you uh, it was what I read in uh, your um, free e free ebook that you give uh, in your website, right? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's an ebook that you collected a lot of opinions from different marketers of the world. The most famous one is um, uh, Guy Kawasaki, who's a great mentor, and uh, actually you collected a lot of opinions from those from those people but for me the most important and the most helpful part was your intro where you wrote an audience is more than just the sum of strategies and tactics uh, that brought its uh, uh, members together a loyal and strong audience is much more than a bunch of readers um, it is a living and breathing entity that ties real people together in other worlds is a community so we're right here right now to talk about how to build a highly engaged community. Awesome. Right. So, um, first of all, how can somebody, a musician or a blogger, whatever, identify who is their audience, what they do, where they live, what their preferences are? Um, that's a great question, and it comes back to marketing at a really fundamental level, which is something I think most people don't understand. When they think about, you know, if you ask what is marketing, they think about all kinds of different tactics. They'll think about, you know, Facebook ads and squeeze pages and email campaigns and Twitter marketing and social media and, you know, direct mail to people and flyers on postcards and all kinds of stuff like that. And none of that is really marketing. Those are just different ways of, of presenting some of your marketing. Strong marketing has three components, and it's very, very simple. Figuring out what you have that is valuable, figuring out who it's valuable to, and then making those people aware that you have that value. And it's that simple. If I've got something good, and it's not good, you know, nothing is good for everyone. Even the cure for cancer is only valuable to people who have cancer, who know someone who does. Yeah, exactly. Right, so have something valuable, know who it's valuable to, and then tell them, look, I have something you want. And it's that straightforward. So the first thing you need to do to assemble, when you're thinking about assembling an audience, assembling a tribe, is get clear on, well, why are you assembling a tribe? A lot of people think, you know, I want to have a tribe of followers, a massive following. For what purpose? Are they eventually going to buy your stuff? Are you hoping that they will spread the word because... If you can go to a record label and tell them, look, I have 50,000 followers on Twitter, they'll want to sign you. You know, are you hoping that you'll have a following strong enough that when you go on tour, they're going to come and listen to your shows and your concerts? What is the purpose? What are you hoping to get out of it? And then think, you know, is it realistic? Great. Is it likely to happen? I mean, if a very common problem with uh, when people look to the internet and online audiences and so forth is that the online world is ge geographically very diverse, it's very spread out. If you're a local band, a local musician or a musician's group, and all you want to do is go on tour in your region, well, you know, having a million followers in China is not going to do much for you. Whereas if you're hoping to sell your music, it's a whole different story. So first think about, well, what do you want to accomplish? What do you want to get out of having this tribe? And once you know that, you can think about, well, who, who do you need to go after? Do you need to go after people who are local to your environment? Do you need to go after people anywhere? And, of course, they all have to be people who actually value what you've got. And who is that? 
Um, and I, I, I consult occasionally for, for artists um, or, or kind of artist types. And there's a strong thing about, you know, artistic integrity. You know, I don't want to sell out. I'm not writing something for, that, that is commercial. You know, it, it is about my art and being true to myself. And this is my opinion, at least, right? Okay. But art is a communications medium. And communication is about what the person who receives the message understands, not about what the person who is speaking wants to say. So it's not selling out to modify your message in such a way that the people you want to understand something actually understand what you want them to understand. Yeah. It's, that's just being a good communicator. Now, changing the messaging, changing the quality of what you're doing to chase after a crowd, that's no good. Right? So it's about finding that happy medium where you're finding the people who are valuing what you've got and making it easy for them to, to understand, find, consume what you're offering. Okay, so to boil it out so far, uh, you're saying that before we identify what our audience is, first we need to identify our goals, what we're looking yeah. for. Are yeah, we looking absolutely. to spread our, our message uh, regionally or worldwide, or do you want to sell, or do we want to tour? So mm -hmm. this is something very important for musicians uh, who are starting right now. First, we need to know what our goal is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what are the steps in broad strokes, at least, to achieve your goal. I mean, very often, incredibly often, it's sad how often, um, people will come to me and say, I've, you know, I, I've got a website and I need help making money with it. And I say, well, what's it about? Why did you start the website? And they say, well, because I heard you can make money with a website. I'm like, no. That's I mean, start. Yes, you can, but that's like saying, you know, I... I it, a website is just another business. It's any kind of business. You don't start a business, you know, fill in the blanks what kind of business, and then, you know, because I heard I can make money with a business, and then, you know, now just tell me what to do with my business. You need to have a, a premise of what you're going to do, what the value is that you're going to offer, and why you care about it enough to actually stick with it along the way. So, you know, what is your end state? What is the lifestyle that you want to create for yourself? what is the kind of voice and platform that you want to create for your music or for your art or for your work? We're, and talking, once, about, we're talking about the identity of the artist right now. Yeah, exactly. The, the identity and the... I mean, ultimately, as an artist, you can have, you know, as a very successful artist, you know, you're, you've, you've made it, it's a home run, you're doing very well for yourself. There are lots of different ways that your lifestyle can look. You can be constantly on tour with thousands and hundreds of thousands of raving fans coming to see you wherever you go. You could be living a quiet life from your home in your own private environment and selling your music to millions of people. You could be doing some very high-priced kind of work and then the rest of your music is free. You know, like, I don't know, I mean, this is not my area of expertise, but, you know, maybe you are giving away your music for free and then you get paid huge amounts of money to do the audio for a movie soundtrack or something. Yeah. Or for your music to be repurposed for commercial purposes in some way, shape, or form. Like a commercial or I don't know what. These are all valid, quote-unquote, they're, they're valid ways of being successful, but they're different and they're not all right for all artists. What's right for you depends on you. Now, each one will have a different path to get there. So before you can think about, well, what's your path? What should I do? I think, well, what, what is the outcome you want to create for yourself? Great. So this is all about setting the right goals first, yeah. realistic goals, so that you know I want to go from point A to point B. And mm -hmm. then throughout, you can separate this, this small trip uh, to, to some smaller distances, and you say, okay, to go to, from A to C, and then to D, so that I can reach B, I have to do those exactly. things. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so uh, talking about this right now, um, I wasn't planning to ask you, but how important is it setting small goals and realistic goals to, to, to reach your final, final goal? Um, there's two scales. There is the short term and the long term. I think in the long term, it's not very important at all. 
Um, I think you should have your kind of big goal of here's where I'm going and know roughly kind of it's in, it's in that direction. And then look at what you need to do for the next few months. What are the next steps? And then get really clear on what you're going to do for that time. And I mean, occasionally you look up and look at the far road and see what's coming. Because if there's a giant obstacle, you need to think about how you're going to get around it. Yeah. But as long as there's no giant obstacle down the road, forget about what you're doing in a year or two years. Focus on what you're doing right now. Get things done. Get one foot in front of the other every day. Get things done. Yeah. This is a, ni- a nice title, actually, for this interview, Get Things Done. It's something that many people miss, right? Absolutely. I mean, you know, I've, I've had a moderate, at least, amount of success in the last year. And, you know, a lot of people have commented, you know, how do you do this? How do you do that? And it's not because I'm such a brilliant, talented guy. It's because I, I get shit done. I, I do the work. I put in the time. Now, yes, I like to think that at least some of it is well-directed and I'm not doing the wrong kind of work. You know, you can do a ton of the wrong work and not get results. But when I look at all the people I've met and consulted with and I've seen who are stuck and not getting results and not getting to where they want to be, some of them are working very hard doing the wrong thing and they need some direction. But most of them are planning and strategizing and thinking and doing very little and you know there's there's the whole there's that saying that you know um a mediocre plan that you do all the work to execute is a lot better than a great plan that you don't do all the work to execute exactly exactly Exactly. because there's going to be you're not going to get everything right there's a certain amount of trial and error i mean we've done at firepool marketing a different campaign almost every month this entire year and you know what? Some of them didn't work out particularly well. But we had enough of them that, you know, we could learn from our mistakes. We get better and better each time. And you keep on moving to the next thing. And there's momentum that builds. Whereas if we had done two campaigns this year, there would be no momentum. They would not build on each other. And if one or two of them happens to strike out, then, you know, I'd be sitting here being like, well, I wouldn't be sitting here because you wouldn't know who I am. Exactly. But I'd be sitting here by myself and thinking, oh, nothing works for me. I can't get results. No, and you know, it's just because I wouldn't have done all the all the work. So, so this is a, this is a great lesson for musicians because many of them start out in the beginning, but mm-hmm. when they see failure coming and coming too much too often, then they say, "Okay, I'd rather give up now and not take my music out there because I might get criticized or I might fail again and again." So, uh, what what you're saying is that people should not be afraid of failure. And failure is just another lesson of not doing it the right way, but changing your tactic. Absolutely, or your strategy. But on the contrary, I'd say failure is important. If you're never, if you never fail, then you're playing way too small a game. <coughs> you're not, you're not pushing the limits of what you're capable of at all. And I think that's very sad. That's I mean, you don't want to be failing all the time because that that sucks. Yeah. But if you're not failing at least a portion of the time, then I think it's time to think bigger. Exactly. And this is actually uh, why you, somebody's an artist. Because artist, this is my motto, uh, differentiate yourself. Be an artist. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't push your limits, then you don't know how, how far you can go with your art. So actually... Absolutely. And, like it's, you know, the people I work with generally are entrepreneurs. And I, I see art... I see entrepreneurship and art as being very similar. In both cases, you're creating something where it wasn't there before. You're creating something new. And that's very different from the path that mo- most people take. And it's a path that involves more failure, by nece- like just by necessity, by definition. If you're creating something brand new, by definition, it means that nobody has done it before. Which means there's, it's impossible for you to have all the information of how it works and what you need to do. You're going to have to figure some of it out as you go, and you're going to get some of it wrong. That's okay. That, that, that's a very, ni- very nice lesson for people. Don't be afraid to try and experiment. And um, talking about, okay, so we set our goals. We say, uh, this, is how, this is what we are. This is our identity. Okay? Mm-hmm. Then many things are involved, like branding, uh, but we'd rather not talk about it right now. Uh, okay. Because we might go away to another conversation. So, okay, we set our goals and we say we want to do this, this is what we are, this is what we believe. And then we start identifying and 
okay, we got our opinion, we got our content, which is great, okay? Mm -hmm. And now we start looking for our audience. Uh, we, we live in internet, okay? And we can reach out to people very easily. Somebody from Philippines can listen to my music that wouldn't do that five years ago, okay? It's still a baby. It's five years mm -hmm. ago, it wasn't there. So, how can a musician um, get the best out of uh, social media and all the internet tactics that are around here to spread their message, spread their music, and get well known, probably. Well, I'll give you two answers to that. One is practical, and it's it's you know it's what marketing has been about forever. And one is a little more you know here's something to think about and explore how to apply it yourself. Right. The fundamental level from you know what any good marketer would tell you now, five years ago, 50 years ago, 500 years ago, is you figured out who your audience is, now figure out where they are. Okay. There is no one always good way of marketing something because the way to market will depend on who the audience is and where they are. If your audience is not on Twitter, then it doesn't matter how good a reach Twitter has and how cheap and how, they're not there. Yeah. Right. So figure out who is your audience, where do they hang out? That's obviously where you have to be marketing. Now, from from a tactical standpoint, in terms of being smart about using the internet, this is something that's relevant to musicians that most people don't quite get yet. I think, at least, is that the internet, the very low cost of interaction that it brings to the table, has changed the dynamics of a fan base to a certain extent. It used to be that your fans are only the people who care about what you're doing a lot. They're the raving, super excited fans. And that's because the cost of getting them organized was fairly high. It took work, it took time, it took logistical effort. And so they had to care a lot to make all that effort to make it happen. Now it's almost free. It's very cheap. It's very easy for people to congregate. And so the new model of organizing people is that you you create multiple tiers for them to interact and engage so that the ones who care a little bit can interact a little bit. The ones who care a lot can interact a lot. Amazing. So you've, so you've got your, your lower kind of end of the pyramid, which are your followers, the people who are going to listen to your music. And that's all they want. They want your music. They want to listen to it. That's it. You don't bug them about much else. Then you've got the people who care more and you share your story with them, and you engage with them, then you're going to have, the, at the top of the pyramid, your evangelists, the people who love you and who love what you do and will buy the t-shirts with your face on it and will tell all their friends about you, etc. And once you've kind of got that pyramid in place, when you've figured out how to attract people into those different levels of the pyramid, you then kind of find a way to help people graduate when they're ready from one level of the pyramid to the next. Great. So, uh, is this actually what you do in uh, your blog? This is how you do. You actually funnel your audience to people that uh, are really loyal to you reading, to people that might be leads to buy from you, to people that mm -hmm. are uh, going to help you get viral or stuff. So, it's all about separating categories of people or of how much they can help you. Um, for sure. I mean, it varies from audience to audience, business to business, depending on your goals. But at a high level, there's a model that I use with most of my consulting clients. We teach it in our training program. It's called the chain of conversion. Chain of conversion. And at a high level, there's a few steps. And every business will go through it, whether they're online, offline, whatever. The first is strangers have to find out about you, and that makes them leads. And in the online world, usually you call this traffic. Okay. Then the, the leads have to like what they see about you, and that makes them prospects. And usually that means in the online world opting into your email list or following you on Twitter or something. Then prospects have to actually buy from you. And whether that means they spend money to get something from you or it just means they take whatever the key action is that you want them to take, but they become your customers. And then finally they have to like what you're doing, like what you're delivering, and continue to work with you and be repeat customers where they, you know, that one transaction becomes an ongoing business relationship. Okay. Now, so, it doesn't have to be a sale. It can be anything. It can be, you know, helping you spread the word about um, what you're doing, what you're working on. It could be whatever you need it to be for your context. Okay, so whatever your goal is that you identified in the beginning. Um, yeah, exactly. So, so, okay, so right now, 
we're talking about how to convert a stranger into a person mm -hmm. that will evangelize your message. So we're, this is how engagement is so important, right? Because we start from, from a person that doesn't even know you, then he gets to know you a little bit more. Then through your system, you try to, to nurture the, the, the person and teach him how to like you. So actually he gets to buy from you and then even talk to uh, their friends or to people close to them about you. Well, yes and no. Yes, but not necessarily either. You see, there, we have a lot of people who read we're doing now at Firepool Marketing and follow our work and our news. And the reality is, the reality for almost any business, is that most of them will never be my customers. That's just the reality of conversion rate. Right? I mean, and which is fine. You know, my services and my products are expensive. They're not for everyone. And I recognize that of people who are interested in what I do at a high level, there's a small subset of them that have have a need for something as refined as I offer one-on-one -on -one or in my in our different training programs and have the budget to pay for it. That's totally Now, my audience is not limited to people who are just going to buy my stuff. I create stuff that is valuable and insight and help for everyone. Because even if you you know you come to my site, you're you're actually a great example. You've downloaded my book, mm -hmm. you've in you've consumed some of my content. As of yet, you have not hired me to do any kind of work. I'm not consulting for you. You're not in my training program. And you may, you may never be, and that's fine, but you're doing this interview with me and you're sharing my message with all the people who are following you. Mm -hmm. And so if I have a one-way track where I'm trying to get leads to become prospects and prospects to become customers and customers to become repeat customers, and that's it, I'm, I'm kind of writing off a big part of my audience. And you have to make it possible so that, on the one hand, I mean, you know, given the choice, you know, if you were to say, would you prefer that I buy your training program or do an interview with you, I said, buy my training program. Right? That, yeah. that would be my preference. But I don't have that choice to make like in most cases. So whichever path is appropriate to you, you can take. And I try to keep all of those paths available. And the cool thing is that they reinforce each other. By doing this interview, you know me better. I have a better sense of what I'm about, what my advice is going to look like, whether it's all airy-fairy nonsense or it's practical, it's applicable, etc. Whether my style works for you, my, my conversational tone, whatever. And that better allows you to make that decision. Okay. That, that, that is great. So, um, except for identifying who your audience is, you, you actually need to, to, to get the, the best out of every single person that finds out about you. So it's not mm -hmm. about just um, s selling a few stuff and then ignoring everybody else. It's about trying to no. squeeze everything you can out of people that, because some people might really want to offer to you, but they don't really have the chance or the channel to do that, right? That's right. Then stop. But I change the language as much as you can out of people. It's about giving as much as you can to people. Because anytime you give anyone anything, it's a transaction. They're giving you their attention, they're giving you uh, more respect, There's the, the relationship gets reinforced, etc. And you want to make sure that in all cases, it's a value greater than cost transaction. You're giving them more than you're asking for exchange. Okay. And so at every level of spectrum, at every, every stage on that ladder, you want to be looking for for, well, you know, someone who's at that tier who doesn't want to buy my T-shirt, but what, what what can I do for them, and what can I ask them for that is smaller than what they want from me? This Which you do at the point where you're selling the T-shirt too, right? Mm -hmm. The T-shirt owning the T-shirt should be worth more to them than than the cost of the T-shirt. But it applies at all levels of of the spectrum, and not just when you're talking about money. Okay, this this is this is, this is great advice, and um. Okay, talking about something, wh while I was reading your book, you know what, what was, um, there was one lady um, called, in just a moment, I need to find her name. Uh, her name was Anita Campbell, okay? Mm -hmm. I didn't know this lady before, but she really drew my attention when she said, don't spend all the time uh, writing updates about your business. It's not a news feed. Uh, it, this is a news feed. This is not a community. So our goal is actually mm -hmm. to build 
uh, a great relationship with our audience and great rapport. Okay, so okay, um, you have your own audience. Okay, so probably you you're the best to talk about it. How can a musician uh, get those leads, as you said, th this traffic, the the strangers that gather to this channel that they identified, like Twitter or Facebook? So they got all those people gather in a channel. How can a musician mm -hmm. turn those people from strangers to audience that really follow the artist? Okay, so assuming they're already looking, you've already got their attention, what you have to do is create a story that ties you and them together. Story. Now, in other words, here's the thing. If you tell me about uh, um, someone that you know, someone that you've heard of, someone that you follow, and I say, you know, what's your connection to them? You're going to tell me a story. Mm -hmm. I found them at this time, and then I discovered this thing and I heard about them there and they came up in this place and then we spoke like this and you're going to describe an escalating story arc and if you can't tell a story it means you have no connection with them mm -hmm. you know all you can say is yeah I've heard of them right but there's no connection so you want to be really conscious about what story can you create that ties you together with your audience and I can tell you how we do it at Firepool Market and the, the way that musicians are going to do it is going to be different because it's different for every person, every audience. With Engagement from Scratch, you go to engagementfromscratch.com and you, you hear about it, or you hear about it, and you know, someone mentions it to you, you read one of my guest posts, whatever. That's the first interaction. You go to Engagement from Scratch and you download the book. That's not something you're hearing, that's something you're doing, right? You download the book. And you're going to receive emails from me saying, I'm, I want to know, how is it coming? How is it going? Are you enjoying it? Do you have feedback? Would you mind sharing it? Would you mind writing a review? And I, I'll also ask, you know, at a, at a, like, by the way, you know, I just want to put it out there, if you want to do an interview with me or something, I'm happy, right? which is how we're doing this interview right now. Mm -hmm. Now, all of these things involve one of two things. Either I'm sharing with you something about myself, um, about stuff that you can do for yourself, or I'm asking you to take action. But in all cases, it's, it creates the story. The story becomes richer and richer. And every step in that story is meant to either give you something of value or ask you for something of smaller value than I've offered. And if, if you don't feel that that's the arrangement, you're going to unsubscribe. You're going to stop being interested in my emails. Now, that's one way to do it. A very different way to do it that we do at fire marketing, and this kind of will illustrate the difference in terms of the goal. So engagement from scratch, I want people to spread the word about the book. It's just about growing the reach. I'm not looking to, to do anything else with that audience other than just build awareness and build relationships. With Firepole Marketing, you opt into my free video course. And it's a five-day video course where each day you get a short video that's a lesson about how to do something that will to make more compromise work for you to take. And there are actions for you to take. Now the idea is that you don't you sign up, you watch these videos, you like the presentation I make, and then you try something and you get results. And you come back and you try you watch the next video and you try something and you get results. Each of these builds a relationship between you, me and you in which I suggest that you do something, you do it, you make more money when you come for more. And what I'm hoping is at the end of this, I'm going to say, hey, you know, I've showed you how to make all this money. Would you like me to help you make some more money? It's not an empty promise because if you've done what I told you to do, you've already made money. And I offer for you to join my program, which should be more valuable to you than the cost of entrance for all the reasons that I've already proven along the way. But it's a specific kind of story in which I'm the guy that helps you to make more money and get better results from your business because I care, which I do. I and mean, people are my emails um, that are automated emails, and I reply to every single one of them. I've given a ton of free advice to people who are not my students or my customers, and that's fine. I'm happy to do it. But this is all part of the narrative that I want to create that is about when I come to the table with my business. Now, the biggest mistake I see people make is copying tactics instead of strategies. So the musician who listens to this interview 
oh, I should create a five-day video course about my music, you got it wrong. That's not what you're supposed to do. What you're supposed to do is think about what is the story that you want to be written in the minds of your audience, and then think about what do you have to do in order to create that story. So copy the strategy and not the tactics. Okay. That, that, that's great, actually. And it all ties up with uh, find out who you are. Okay, so you find the identity, and then you say that the best way is to be in people's minds with a story you're going to mm -hmm. create. So whatever people uh, think about you, the relationship you have with them is going to be their story. Like for me, absolutely, you are the person that answered to my email the very same day and said yes, okay, let's have an interview. And then we talked about and about about it, and you were positive with everything. So for me, you you are mm -hmm. like a, a person that was positive to help me and get this interview done. So this is my absolutely. story. That Danny, who is Danny? For me, Danny is a friendly person that said yes and tried to help me out without even knowing me. So this is my story. And, and the really important thing, and, and I'm very glad story because that's a story that I want written in people's books. But the really important thing to remember when creating this, the other place where people kind of tend to go the wrong way, what they... Sorry, I'll just switch this off. ...tend to do is think, okay, I need to create a story. What story should I write? And they go about writing a big work of fiction. Mm -hmm. And when you're writing a piece of fiction, that's not creating a genuine story. That's being a scam artist, right? Right. I do this online all the time, and in particularly the internet marketing world, where you go to some internet marketing guru who appears out of nowhere, right? You haven't seen them around. They're selling a product you've never heard of before. They have a whole a whole bunch of videos in rapid succession. The videos are long. They take you through a story. You get emails from them and from all the people who are promoting them. Um, so it feels like you and them, you go back a long way. You've got this long story. Even though you've only heard three days ago. And they sell you the product and they disappear. And six months later, they show up again selling a whole different product uh -huh. with a whole different story. That's not, not a real story and that doesn't create a real audience. A real Real audience is created by telling a true story. Okay. Right? It's the difference between meeting a girl and taking her out and being yourself and taking her to do interesting things and building a story together versus being a pickup artist that feeds every girl with the same lines and goes through the same routine. You're feeding a story, but it's not a real story. It's not the story that you have with them for real. Mm -hmm. And you can sometimes get results in the short term, but in the long term, it never works. So it's got to be the right, the real story. All right. This is this is an amazing step, actually, and we can jump right out to uh, when it comes to authenticity. Okay. So this is what you're saying that you have to be yourself. You have to be authentic. Okay. Mm -hmm. So um, here here is my big question, because we're talking about about musicians, and you probably uh, do you go to concerts? Not often. Not often. I, I'm probably not even close to being your target market by the way. Okay, I will not <laughs> try to sell matter. you anything. All right, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so, because I, I, I've been in a concert actually last night. So, what I saw and what I see every time is that on the stage, we're not talking about a musician. We're talking about a persona. We're talking mm -hmm. about somebody else. Probably is not even close to the real person that this musician is. So, maybe we have a big exception here that the musicians probably they have to cultivate a persona and sometimes they might get rid of the authenticity and try to get like a new version of themselves, an alter ego. Mm -hmm. Okay, so how do you feel about this? Creating a persona that will support your ideas and your music? I think there's different ways to go about doing it. And when you think about being authentic and being trans you've got to recognize that you are a whole bunch of different people. I mean, who you are, the way you communicate, the way you project is different when you're with parents, different when you're with your grandparents, different when you're with your girlfriend, different when you're at the office, different when you're visiting your five-year-old cousin's daycare, right? You'd be in different ways to fit the situation, to fit the people you're talking to. So, you know, not sharing everything with everyone is not about being opaque or hiding things. It's just about, you know, transparency is 
is not the same thing as full disclosure. Authenticity is not the same thing as like dumping everything on everyone. Uh-huh. So it's totally legitimate to say that you know this is who I am in front of my audience. Now the thing is that who you are in front of your audience should be authentic and true to who you are in general. Not all of who you are, and there's parts of it that are not going to be present elsewhere, but it shouldn't be fake. And it, it's a subtle um, but it's an important distinction. Mm-hmm. Because I don't believe that it's sustainable to just put on a show all the time. Okay, that, that's great. And this is uh, why actually, when people tell me that, okay, this band is the new Beatles, or this band is the new Rolling Stones, I always tell them, wait, because the Rolling Stones have been out there for many years, and we know that these guys, from year one till the end, they had a personality and they had a character mm-hmm. and they show this through all the shows and everything, the interviews. So we know them that is themselves. Now this band, they might be fake. They might be just uh, trying to put a persona out that is not going to last. So this is why actually we see many bands getting lost in the ocean because actually you, you put it great, okay, that you need to be yourself and try to keep the distance from the audience, like sharing a few things like you share a few things with your parents and share some other things with the audience. So probably sell your cool side to the audience, but always be yourself, not do something that is over you, because otherwise, after many years, you're going to That's get That's exactly it. Because the thing, I mean, there's, I don't remember where the quote comes from. I think it's Mark Twain. He's, you know, I don't lie that way. I don't have to keep track of what I said to who. And that's it. as long as you're just yourself, a and you know, as long as you're legitimately interesting, you have something of value for your audience. Because if you don't, then nobody's going to fall away. But if you are interesting, you do have something that people look at. And as long as you're just yourself, that story is going to start emerging. It just has to happen because by virtue of interacting in the world, people are going to have to see who you are and what you're about. Okay. So... So th- this is this is uh, something great for artists to know that you have to be yourself, and of course you're an artist. But again, behind the artist there is a real person, and what is going to last is your real self actually, and what you give to people, the value you give to people as a character. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, which doesn't mean that you're cons- either. I mean, you know, people learn, people change, people grow, people adapt, and that's fine. That's normal. That's healthy, right? I mean, look at big artists, their style in terms of the art and what they kind of put across along the way in the interviews and the communications, you know, over the course of five, ten years, it's going to grow and evolve. And saying, you know, okay, what is my persona going to be? It's going to be this. It's going, it ties you into a straitjacket that doesn't allow for all that kind of growth that a real person, a real brand, a real identity is going to have. Okay. And Okay, now talking about this, because there are many people that, there might be many people that are like you, okay, there might be many Dannys out there, there might be many mm-hmm. Tommies out there, okay, with the same character like me, but we often see that at the end of the day, only a few of them or a bunch of them actually make it and become well known and well known to the audience, okay, mm-hmm. so what is your advice to musicians so that they can stand out and get picked out of this ocean of artists out there. What, what is one thing that you would suggest them to do? What I would suggest they, they do is box in their weight class. If you're just a little guy starting out, you know, a lot of people have dreams about, you know, that home run opportunity. You know, you're playing in an obscure club and some talent scout that you did he is finds you and signs you a record deal and suddenly you're an international superstar. Yeah. And that's like someone saying, you know, I'm I'm gonna here's my like pitch. I'm gonna buy a lottery ticket and you know it's it's gonna be the, the ticket. It can always happen, but that's not a plan. that's a dream. Uh-huh. A real plan you know if I want to get rich, I have ten dollars now, I'm gonna find a way to turn that ten into twenty and turn that twenty into forty and turn that forty into and turn that 80 into 160 and keep on going. Right? So as an artist, if you've got two followers right now, and let's 
your mom and your dad and think about who are my first 10 followers going to be. When you've got 10, think about, you know, where am I going to get another 10? When you've got 20, think, where am I going to get another 20? When you fight at your level, you keep trying to grow. Each time, you know, now I've got 10 followers who can help me grow. Now I've got 20 followers who can help me grow. Now I've got 200. Now I've got 2,000. And it starts growing. And, you know, getting to 4,000, I already have 2,000, is doable. Getting to 4,000 when you have is a pipe dream. Mm -hmm. So think about, not, you know, okay, I want to be a giant mega superstar, and that's my goal. So, you know, the only way I can see to get from here to there is, is someone who's going to sign me that huge international record deal. Well, that's not a practical plan to go from here to there. Think about, how do I do the next two steps? Because the faster you do the next two steps, the faster you steps after that, and keep on going. And there's a momentum that builds and can happen a lot faster than you think. I mean, a year Day, nobody online knew who I was. You know, we have almost 10,000 people, well over 10,000 people who read the blog every month now. We've got lots of followers, we've got tons of people who've read the book. There's a big following, and it happened pretty fast, but it happened fast because I never focused on the big home run. I was always, okay, what am I going to do to go a little bit further than where I am now, as fast as, as I can, as well as I can. All right. So this is great, actually, identifying. Uh, real realistic goals and going step by step, not trying to make the big move because probably this is mm -hmm. going to lead you to nowhere. Yeah, oh. leveraging the success you've had to have more success tomorrow that you can then leverage to have more success the day after that. All right. Um, okay, so, so this is great. Actually, if you have two people, try to make the best out of them and give them the best value because mm -hmm. these two two people will get... 20 and then they will get 200 and then you're going to get more and more and more. So actually yep, trying exactly. to, keep, to, to keep this engagement with your current audience is the key, what you say, to, to stand out of the ocean of artists. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, with Engagement from Scratch, the book that I published, mm -hmm. uh, I had 30 people who contributed to the book and they amazing contributions. And I have a whole bunch of people who read it in advance and gave me feedback and who gave me testimonials for the front cover and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, you know, it's a whole different story how I got them to do that in the first place, and that was the same process of taking what you've got going a little bit further. But so I had a small group of people who'd already seen the book, who'd already expressed interest. That's kind of like the, the 5, 10, 15 people who've seen it who like it. Now, the book was published. I could have sent them all a book saying, thank you very much. But instead of that, I sent them two books. I sent them one sign saying, thank you very much. And the second one says, and ideas, they're, they're not for keeping, they're for sharing. That's Seth for someone you think will like it. This is yeah. Seth Godin, right? <laughs> so in the musical environment, right, let's think about your CD and you've got five people who you know love your CD. Don't just create a CD for them and try to sell it to them because, you know, you'll get 15 bucks each and that's $75 and, you know, you've tapped out your burn a CD for them, make something extra special, and give them each three copies, nice and gift wrapped, and say, look, one's for you, the other two, give them to someone you think will like it, will find it valuable. You know, you can give it away, big, massive thing on your blog, or give it to a friend that you think will enjoy it. You know, no strings, no nothing. And inside each one, have a little business card or note that says, you know, I'm just getting started as an artist. If you like what I'm doing, I'd really appreciate an email to give me some encouragement. And you build that following one person at a time. That, that, that's, that's actually great. I never thought about it. And that's amazing. I, first, I'll start doing this with my band. So thanks a lot awesome. for this advice. Um, email me. Let me know how it goes. Of course, okay. of course. It's a great idea. Okay. Um, all right. So, so you, you, what, you, what you're saying is that... Um, um, <coughs> j just a moment. Excuse me. Sure. Okay, so uh, this tactic you said right now, okay, that uh, we 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 give something for free to people and we try to make them share it because this is valuable mm -hmm. and valuable ideas are for sharing. Okay. Well, here's the, here's the nuance. Find a way, first of all, because giving away 
buy something for free is a tactic. The strategy here is you want to do two things. The first thing you want to do is exceed people's expectations. Whatever they're expecting from you, do better. And the second thing right. is give them a good and really easy, good reason and an easy way to spread the word. You know, and I could have sent them, you know, I could have sent them by email. Here's the PDF of my book. Email it to someone else. They get around to it. If I send them two books, one of them is going to sit on their desk until they remember to give it to someone, right? Because they've got to put it somewhere. So, and by the way, this wasn't cheap. I mean, I spent like between postage and and printing and all that, I probably spent like three thousand dollars mailing out the books. Like that was the most okay. part of the whole book production campaign. But oh. think of that again. First of all, how can you exceed their expectations, mm-hmm. and how can you give them a really good reason and a really easy way to spread the word? Okay, so this is where digital uh, life comes in. You know, uh, mm-hmm. having something digital like your ebook. It's a great way, uh, with low cost or no cost at all, to share something, an idea. Okay, so... Well, it's a, it's a low and easy way for new people to access my stuff. Okay. But it's not the easiest way for people to share. It's easy to share, but it doesn't give people a strong enough reason to sh- share. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, so w- what comes to my mind right now is uh, scarcity, okay? A book mm-hmm. is limited. You can print 10 books, so you have 10 books. You can write one digital book, and you have unlimited amount of digital mm-hmm. books, right? So uh, giving a book is something tangible that people can actually see that this got printed, and somebody made the, the cover and everything, and this one, if I have it, and nobody else can have it, okay? So this is why it's mm-hmm. so important. It feels important. substantial. It feels more valuable. Mm-hmm. Even... It's the same book that people can download. The book that they download feels more valuable because there's a physical book. The same way, you know, you give someone a CD, it's got a nice cover, you give, give them to share, they show the CD to a friend, and they want to go online and download your stuff, more so than if they just hear your music. I mean, the music has to be good. If the music sucks, they're not yeah. going to care. But they hear the music, you show them, it's like, this is serious something valuable and they got this CD it's signed straight to the musician I want to support them I want to be a part of that so you make it personal okay so all right uh, so let, let's say to my mind right now digital things digital music is for sharing and accessing the content more easily mm-hmm. while tangible things yeah. is for making the experience more personal and more limited to make people f- yeah. feel more valuable about owning this this content. Absolutely, we're we're running up against the hour. I don't want to rush the the interview, but I do have uh, another commitment okay. soon. Is there like a final question? Okay, we can, okay. Can I talk through to that, tie it all together, or what? What would you like to cover? Okay, that that was great. Okay, so if we have to answer one last question, okay, that would be that would be uh, okay. So let's say I'm a musician, okay? Obviously, I know mm-hmm. a few things about marketing more than a normal musician uh, because I've been studying for a long, a long time. But if there is a musician that gets interested in our conversation and says, okay, I'm really interested in this marketing tactics and I'd rather know a few things to start myself out start, uh, studying marketing, um, what would be the basic principles you would like a musician to know while they start out? things I said when we first started the interview. Marketing fundamentally is about understanding what you have that is valuable, understanding who that is valuable to, and finding a way to make them aware of the fact that you have that value. And I think the best thing to reverse engine for, for a musician is to think about when's the last time that another brand or product or anyone got you to take an action they got you to do something, they got you to buy something, they got you to share something. How did they do it? What did they do that made you want to take that action? That's what you need to figure out how to do. And, and it happens to you all the time. We all take these actions all the time. And it's not because we're manipulated or advertising is bombarding us or anything like that. It's because we have needs, we have interests, and there are enough people out there who are smart enough to tap into those that give us what we want. 
And so pay attention to the way in which that happens. That's it. And not try to copy actually what they do, but try to implement their strategies and try to put in your own way with your own identity and de integrity. Absolutely. So uh, I just like to mention something before before we go. Something that the most helpful part of your intro was there are four distinct distinct stages involved uh, in growing an audience online. One, truly awesome content. So that means that if your music sucks, actually you can go nowhere, no matter how much effective yeah, content nothing, nothing you have. Nothing else is going to matter. This is this yeah, is and it's important to remember, by the way, that that is in the ear of the beholder. You know, you may hate, I don't know, Britney Spears or whatever. That doesn't right. matter. Some people like her, right? Awesome is in the ear of the beholder. As long as you've got to, just, somebody's got to like music, and it can't just be your mom. Okay. All right. Uh, the second one is build your community. Okay. So you actually find people that are interested in your music and what you what you have to offer, and then try to build connections with them, and try to get, bring them together into one one specific channel. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, three, be everywhere. This is the part where we start getting viral, where we start uh, appearing in different media like Twitter or Facebook, or then somebody gets an interview out of us, or we appear in a in a radio show or anything else. So we try to make people uh, feel that we are everywhere. Many people are talking about us. So this mm -hmm. is like a social proof. That means that we are important for them. Okay? And people start getting curious like, oh, many people saw this show and many people talk about them and I heard them talking on the radio and stuff. What, who are they? So they start getting interested about you. Okay? And the last step is what probably every, every musician is interested in is getting viral. Okay? So it is trying to get real growth out of real people and try to find the people that will, that will spread your message throughout all this media. Mm -hmm. And actually try maybe make sales, maybe share what you have and try to spread the word. So this is a great formula. Yeah, what, what it comes down to is that if you have great content and you have a community around that content, by being... In everywhere, by doing that really smart strategic promotion, you can get to a tipping point where your audience is big enough to start growing itself, and it just explodes. It's like a, it's it's like a tipping point. It's like lighting a fuse, and then boom, it just it gets huge. But you've got to have that really awesome content. You've got to have that community of core supporters around it, and you've got to work very hard for the promotion for everyone for for you to get. That. Okay. So that, that's great. So musicians, wherever you are right now, wherever you're listening from uh, to us, try to build a community around your audience. Try to engage. Yeah, and hey, you can get all the details at uh, you know, from scratch com. There's a button that says download the book, and you can download the whole thing for free. Of course, or if you want it in print, then go to Amazon. Of course, we're gonna give all the details under the interview and everything. So of course. Thank you very much for the interview, Danny. That was amazing. I got a lot out of it, and I hope that all the musicians that are out there in Greece and listen to us, I hope they can get the best out of it and try to implement what you, what you suggested so far. I hope so, too. It was a lot of fun. Thank you very much for having me. That's great. Thanks, everybody, for watching. This was Danny from uh, uh, Farpool Marketing, the author of book Engagement from Scratch. You can download it for free. So thanks a lot, Danny, and uh, we'll talk again soon, I guess. Awesome. Bye-bye.